Hi, I'm Kat Rosenfield. And I'm Phoebe maltz Bovey, and together we are Feminine Chaos. And Kat has been up to some very exciting things lately that she is going to explain. It's been a very exciting July. Um, the last time we chatted, I was, uh, I was the, on the day of the release of this audiobook, Stanley's Alliance is a Trick of Light, that I had co-written with Stan uh, last year before he passed away. And since then, the book debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. Super exciting. And um, then I was off to California to do Comic-Con, which was a four-day crazy whirlwind. Um, but very successful. We had a panel. It was a lot of fun. So, um, you know, big thanks to any listeners or viewers of our podcast who decided to order the audiobook. We appreciate your support. You helped. <laughs> exactly. That's, it's fantastic. Um, I have nothing as glamorous to report, although um, I have a baby now somewhat more mobile than before, and that is both exciting and terrifying. So, you know, we've got all those outlet covers in and you know, that sort of thing. That's uh, oh, yeah. what's been happening here. Um, so our topics for today, um, what I've put in our outline document here is that the theme for today is going to be plight of the men. Yeah. Okay. Talking plight a lot about men. men, men today. We're talking about men. Mm -hmm. All, all men. Hashtag yes, all of them. And... I think we have five separate items that are about, are about either sad or bad men in one way or another. So the theme is half of humanity, men. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to start with a man who I remember from my childhood of watching age inappropriate television. Um, you're good enough. You're strong enough. And gosh, darn it. People, or is it I'm good enough. I'm strong enough. And gosh, darn it. People like me. Yeah. Al Franken who I remember much more from Saturday Night Live than from politics because of, who knows, um, cultural references being what they are. But um, he was one of the bad men of Me Too. But was he that bad? Well, that's a question. And Jane Mayer um, wrote about this in the New Yorker, which I learned the way one learns these things these days by everybody on Twitter was very angry. Um, and I wanted to know why. So I read the article and I, I get it, but I also, yeah, we have some thoughts on this, I think. Oh, I must so, have been traveling cause I missed the anger. Um, Oh, there was Twitter anger. People were felt that it was kind of, um, if a man has brought his own demise, his own cancellation, whatever, upon himself, that he should not be, or an article should not be blaming his accusers. Uh, or, right. So basically, you know, it's the, the same effect, you know, anytime when, when uh, John Gomeshi or Louis C.K. or anybody wants to resurface after being canceled, we don't like that. Right, right. Although it's it's unclear how resurfaced he is. It seems more just that, I mean, he had a New Yorker article written about him. It doesn't seem that he's back back. It seems like he's one of the few cancellation stories in part just because of what the nature of resigning from the Senate means mm -hmm. as versus not doing a comedy show for a while and then doing another comedy show. Mm -hmm. The gist of it is that he's kind of done. Um, that he's shuffling around his house now and right, he's alone. Not done, right. He's not done as in destitute, miserable. He still has his family, but he's done professionally is kind of the implication. And yet he is being covered in the New Yorker and not as some sort of curiosity. So um, that there's a lot there. There's a lot there. So, um, and also a lot had to do with Jane Mayer being a very um, esteemed, famous reporter. So, um, and there was yes, a, not a, not just a reporter, but she was the. What, I, I can't remember if it was her or her and Ronan Farrow, but published mm -hmm. that big piece right. that mainstreamed some of the allegations against Brett Kavanaugh that turned out to actually be somewhat shaky. Um, right, the right, 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 right. Aftermath. Um, so I think maybe people saw this as a betrayal possibly from somebody they thought 
was on their team and would never cross the aisle to make right. contact with a bad man. Well, also just the New Yorker in general has been kind of between um, the Ronan Farrow stuff um, and various other writing in it lately. It's been kind of, I don't know if it's gone to the left or if it's just that the sort of mainstream left has gone to a certain sort of progressive spot and it's been kind of hovering there. And this seemed a little like a strange angle for that publication. And it seemed like the only thing that anchored it in progressivism was this kind of conservative hypocrisy angle that like, how could you be so upset about Al Franken and okay with Trump, okay with um, Roy Moore, okay with various other um, right-wing politicians who have or are alleged to have done worse? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought well, it was, I mean, it was interesting, and we should probably just mention this for anybody who didn't read this piece, um, that what Mayor discovered and what she chose to highlight when she um, tweeted this article out was that the original allegations that kicked off um, all of the kind of rolling ball of allegations that followed was from Leanne Tweeden, and it turns out that her story just doesn't really add up, um, and that nobody or had, does it or does it turn out well? I mean, that nobody yeah. at the time. I mean, some of some of this was actually verifiably false things like you know the idea that that he had written this skit just for her when he oh, performed okay. it with other people so i wondered about hinging so much on that because to me that seemed kind of like an interesting fact an interesting fact check but kind of neither here nor there in a way like he could have still done it creepily with her and you know what i mean like it could be that you know what i mean like it just seemed to me that didn't seem like the gotcha that it was being presented as, it seemed more like a little bit of a nitpick. I guess, except that she, she asserted that he had written it just for her, just to do this to her. So I think that... Well, it's you know, weird. It's weird, the notion that the skit was about... Like, it seemed too meta, the whole thing that, like, it's a skit where somebody, the character in the skit, says he's ha has written something to kiss a woman. Mm-hmm. And then she claimed that he did that. And that was just kind of that he himself, not the character, did that for a USO right. show. Right. So that was weird. Um, yeah. You know, maybe maybe it's not. I don't know if it's a gotcha. I, I thought it was. I, I don't know. It, it changed the way that I felt about it, but perhaps mm -hmm. not how everybody felt about it. Mm -hmm. um, but also interesting to me is that um, so many of the people who contributed to the calls, you know, Franken's colleagues who called for him to resign without an investigation, um, without, you know, going through the normal process, which I always thought at the time was a poor choice. Um, but, you know, all, so many of them were willing to go on the record saying, this was a mistake. I really regret this. Um, somebody, mm -hmm. maybe it was, maybe it was Patrick Leahy said that it was like the worst mistake he'd made in his time in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wonder, you know, it's, it's interesting that, Franken is the case that ended up being the focus here. You know, if you were going to do some kind of a walk back on a Me Too moment, um, mm -hmm. that it was him. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on why he specifically. Um, well, I think what's interesting about this one to me is, well, I mean, there are a couple funny things about it that stood out in the article, like this weird um, thing about. Oh, well, I guess mm, I'll start with the sort of situating it like more um, big picture is that I think what this really shows is that Me Too doesn't allow for the possibility, and this is what I tweeted, so I'm going to be one of these people who quotes their own tweet, not quotes, but whatever, paraphrases their own tweets, which is very gauche. But anyway, um, it doesn't really conceptually allow for saying that somebody was gross but not evil. Mm -hmm. You're saying that somebody has done things that are wrong, but not that wrong. And I feel like this is a fine case of somebody who behaved in ways that were wrong, but not cancellation worthy wrong. And somehow because of the way Me Too has played out, the only thing you can say in that case is actually this person didn't do anything wrong and in fact has been wrong. And it seems like it can be both true that he was that sort of 
canceled unnecessarily and that the way he behaved once it's laid out in an article actually makes it, the article is meant to show you that he didn't do anything. And I hadn't really paid much attention to this particular story when I first heard about it and came away from the article thinking, no, actually he's been kind of gross and inappropriate and something short of cancellation would have been necessary there. So one claim is that he would kiss random women on the mouth and that this is a New York greeting. I am from New York city. Originally, this is not a thing kissing random women on the mouth when you greet them who are not. I haven't experienced that either. I thought that was supposed to be a show business thing, which is a world that I'm not familiar with. So. I mean, I've been places out where you would at least have seen, like, this is not a thing. It didn't make any sense that this line from the article was, um, sorry, he tended to hug many people and kiss some even on the mouth. It was the New York hello, goodbye kiss, a longtime advisor told me. And then, um, told, not told me, told uh, Jane Mayer. And then she writes, the talk show host Randy Rhodes and the comedian Sarah Silverman have described Franken as a social, not a sexual, quote, lip kisser. Silverman told GQ he has no sexuality and that he wasn't happy about this, it's jokingly or whatever. Um, nevertheless, after Franken kissed a female acquaintance on the mouth in 2007 during his first campaign, an aide from South Dakota, David Benson, took him aside and said, don't do that. Really, Franken said, Benson warned him that people might misinterpret it. And I just thought, like, ugh, like, I guess I thought of it just from the perspective, not of politics or show business or anything like this, but just men who do things like this exist in the world, and it is gross, and whether he's playing naive or just doesn't feel that he has to bother being considerate, like, it just seems like this is gross, and, like, yeah, maybe maybe he should have been called out on that. It doesn't mean canceled, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, what I think is a lot of this stuff, you know, probably wasn't appropriate and should have been addressed at the time. Um, the fact that it instead emerged, some of it in the form of anonymous allegations as this kind of pile-on um, makes the way that this played out distasteful to me. Um, mm-hmm. And it, you know, if it had to happen this way, and I think part of the, not just in this case, but in a few of the cases that have been sort of prominent, maybe slightly polarizing Me Too moments, um, you have men who were behaving in a way that they may have had good reason to think was okay 10 or 15 years ago, um, but that has now been recast as something more predatory. Um, and, they're ha- and they have to respond to that now. Um, and, you know, and that's why we get these kind of like info dump allegations where it's like, mm-hmm. well, back in 2003, he did this to me. And in 2007, mm-hmm. this and this. Um, but even then, the, the choice to treat it as this cat, catastrophic thing instead of just saying, okay, like, yes, you know, I recognize that this behavior was inappropriate at the time and particularly has not aged well. And, you know, and I apologize and that should be enough. I kind of, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I agree and disagree. So I agree that it's, that it probably was not brought up at the time or not really enough. But I think the problem with, and this is sort of the challenge with me too, is that these are things where whatever balance of power or cultural moment or whatever was a problem, it was a problem that such things could not be brought up in the past. I think the problem now is that they can be brought up, but only as catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So that nuance, that middle ground where you can say, this is bad, the person who did it is being, ugh, but is not evil, seems not to be possible. And it seems like, Instead, you get this kind of bucket where every man who's ever been a little bit gross, who's ever not said the right thing about Me Too or the politically proper thing, whatever, gets all put in this one bucket of bad. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter sort of how bad. And there's no space to just kind of be like a little annoyed at anybody. You know what I mean? And then I think it just keeps, it it reinforces the situation where all you can say, if you feel that this was an overreaction or a pile on was that it didn't matter. You know what I mean? I feel like the missing space is to say it mattered, but shouldn't 
negate everything else ever done. And I mean, I guess I feel like something about this article that was trying to say that the case had been overstated against him somehow in turn understated it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that was kind of how I came away with it. And I guess what I also just thought in terms of like this conservative hypocrisy angle is everybody comes across looking like a hypocrite because this, this part of it that really jumped out at me was, um, so what some, one of these allegations that he'd been creepy, whatever, um, I'm quoting the article now. Franken was stricken when I related this woman's uh, comment, her comments to him. Look, he said, this has really affected my family. I loved being in the Senate. I loved my staff. We had fun and we got good things done, big and small. And they all meant something to me. He started to cry. And I'm thinking like every man who's been part of this Me Too thing has been upset about it. Mm-hmm. But to only be upset about it when it's somebody sort of like from your side is like, I don't know. I feel like e- like either you take a larger message from it that maybe destroying or canceling people over minor things is not great. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it just seemed like the New Yorker is going to be upset when it's Al Franken, but are they going to be upset each time? You know, that seems a little... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. And I mean, <laughs> the uh, the conservative... Um, or right-wing critiques that I saw of this article all pretty much made a version of that point. It was like, you know, if, uh, like if you, if this didn't bother you when, you know, Brett Kavanaugh was on the chopping block, you know, why are you being so sympathetic now? Well, exactly. I mean, I guess I think, I think it's worth considering that, you know, these things are upsetting. I think it's also worth remembering that if somebody has, if a man for the purposes of this theme and this particular topic has done something wrong and he gets in trouble, yeah, of course it's going to have fallout on his family, but you can't just say, well, then the actual feminist thing is um, to never get a man in trouble for anything because what about think of his wife and daughter. And speaking of daughter, there's another quote that really jumped out at me that was, Franken's office proposed that Franken's daughter speak with um, Jill. Is it Gillibrand or Gillibrand? Oh my God. Gillibrand, I think. If not watched, I've like read, <laughs> but not watched in a while. Um, but that, okay. Rather than him, that, that his daughter should get involved. And that just seemed very like, it did seem sort of maybe Kavanaugh ish. The whole, like as the father of a daughter angle. Maybe I'd, I'm willing, I'm willing to interpret that charitably in that, you know, I, if it had been me, I wouldn't have wanted to talk to Kristen Gillibrand at that point either. <laughs> um, and I would have been, you know, yeah, inclined to, fair. to dispatch somebody who, you know, who was on my team, but who was also a member of the, um, aggrieved sex to. I maybe. guess. I don't know. I feel like, I just think there should be some sort of thing where people's immediate family are just like, have nothing to do with it and should be assumed to be on your side, which is nice, but like, of course they support you, but it doesn't matter in a way, like for the bigger, I don't know. The involvement of family seems strange to me, Yeah, but I don't know. I, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure what the biggest takeaway here is. Um, I mean, aside from the, the me too angle, I think is just this need for a middle ground so that people aren't constantly, this one's fine. This one's evil. Um, politically, I guess maybe it's that, Democrats are, you know, and this could be the like, what gets Trump reelected style conversation, but like, you know, Trump gets to be the kind of, you know, avatar for the id of everybody, whereas the Democrats like slip up a little bit, like it's just reading that Warren has had unpaid interns which i think is bad but does that mean never mind let's cancel her you know what i mean like every little slip up is is cancel worthy yeah yeah well i mean somebody what vacuum does that create kind of yeah i feel like i saw somebody i'm not i don't remember who so sorry that person if you were wherever you were um was pointing out that the optics of you know having Franken still be, you know, in his position um, in politics, you know, having gone through an investigation or not at the point at which Kavanaugh was being confirmed might have been 
troublesome for the Democrats. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I also would say that these things um, and this, it kind of very tangentially connects to some of the publishing stories we've talked about. These things, when there's nothing to them, do have a way of just blowing over. Like there was one in Canada um, where a TV host was very not credibly accused of some sort of creepiness. Mm -hmm. And like you never hear about this anymore. And he's still absolutely got like some public television um, interviewer. And like you never hear about this anymore. It was like a news story for five minutes. And he was, even Justin Trudeau was like for five minutes. Oh, he was creepy once like many years ago. And there's a picture of him looking a little creepy or something. These things, you know, I, I guess with the Franken thing, I think the article that, yeah, I mean, the examples did seem like he was probably pretty unpleasant. People probably didn't feel in a position to say anything because he was powerful and he was playing it as jokes. And, and I guess I, the other thing I was thinking about um, was just this notion of, that his act, his persona was the asshole and what that mm-hmm. means and like why and how it's, it is actually kind of a lot like Trump, except with Trump, it's maybe less articulated what's persona and who knows what's actually under there, if anything. But, yeah. um, I don't want to think about what's under uh, there. <laughs> yeah, I did, uh, um, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess like I think of somebody like, not Chuck Schumer, but like Amy Schumer, whose persona is the kind of basic whatever. It's one thing in in comedy or just in, you know, like for celebrity, but once a celebrity crosses over to politics, like this sort of, oh no, I was joking thing seems like a little troubling. Yeah. At the same time, you know, somebody is going to have to come out and say that doesn't fly anymore um, because otherwise, how will they know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I guess, yeah, I just worry politically about the whole sort of tiny slip ups ruining somebody on the left. And then you look at the right and it's like they can, they're celebrated for, yeah. Yes. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. But that's, that's just, but I live in Canada. It's so not my problem, even though I am American. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. So that's, that's Al Franken. So we have more on Al Franken specifically. No, I, I think, you know, I feel kind of bad for him. I, but apart from that. <laughs> I think I had his book as a kid. Like, Oh, you know, I actually. Saturday Night Live. And, I worked on his book. My first job ever out of college, I was a publicist at Dutton. And uh, lying, lying liars who tell and the lies they tell or <laughs> I don't remember, whatever. The one about lies. There's a lot of lies. Um, I, I worked on that book. Wow. Um, it did very well. That was, yeah, that was before he actually made his, um, made his jump into politics. He was just kind of like on the fringe, a political oh. comedian. Well, who knows where he will resurface. Maybe he will have some comedy special where he speaks up for the plight of the canceled, because that seems like, um, we, we have not, or at least I have not actually seen the Aziz Ansari we have to, you know, ding, ding, we have to... <laughs> yeah, we mentioned Aziz. <laughs> um, I have not seen the comedy special where he, whatever, something about Me Too. Maybe one day. Yeah, Maybe I, I have my, my uh, you know, one sentence reaction is that it wasn't funny. Yeah, that's kind of what I have heard and, you know, only so much Netflix time and there's the Yummy Mummies Australian reality show about... Um, very sort of like reality TV from a long time ago, but still being made. And if you're really, really tired, that's probably easier to follow. Um, So we have another topic about several other topics about bad men. Um, Or sad men. Which one is bad men, sad men. There's a really permeable membrane between Mm -hmm. bad men and sad men. Sometimes they can be both. Maybe this, this, article, which according to the tab I have open, has a a mere 2,221 comments on it. And I have read, I think, none of them, which is not usual for me. Normally, if I have the time, I will try to read some article comments because I love those. This is um, an article that was in the New York Times Magazine um, on July 17th by Claudia Rankin, who is... 
a writer, a Yale professor, and a, a genius, MacArthur Genius Grant winner. Um, so, and it's called, I wanted to know what white men thought about their privilege. So I asked, subhead, my college class asks what it means to be white in America, but interrogating that question as a black woman in the real world is much harder to do. And it's the topic of privilege. So I'm, well, I have not read this article as closely as I would like due to some practicalities of the last few weeks. Um, I'm all over the topic. Kat, I think you may have read the article better than I did. What's, what's it about? Uh, so basically, um, through the lens of her interactions with men in airports and on airplanes, because uh, Claudia Rankin travels a lot um, in, for, in first class, which is nice. Yes. Um, I guess presumably for her job or possibly just for fun. Um, she wanted to try and bring her classroom discussions surrounding whiteness and white privilege into the real world um, to find out, you know, to engage white men, just random white men on airplanes and in airports uh, in some discussions about what their privilege meant to them. And their white male privilege is right, what, which is white, important. Yes. So what was Funny to me about this article is that the headline's kind of a misnomer. Like, she says, so I asked, but she mostly doesn't ask. Um, she yes, spends, that's true. The entire article, virtually the entire article, she spends thinking about asking and then imagining how these men might respond, um, you know, in what's supposed to be an empathic exercise, but really is... I mean, it strikes me mostly as her just kind of projecting um, unflattering, uncharitable assumptions all over these guys. Um, and then she'll, she'll decide that she's imagined it efficiently and doesn't need to ask after all. Um, and it's not until the very end of the article, she starts to talk with a guy who, unlike some of the other ones who, the other men and the other experiences that are highlighted in this piece, um, who's more evidently willing right up front to kind of validate her her lens on the world, um, which is like entirely about privilege and, you know, coming at things from a place of privilege and seeing things through a race-based lens. Um, and so she actually does talk to him a little bit, but she still doesn't ask him what he thinks. She just kind of instructs him um, about right. how he should think differently. Um, yeah, so it's definitely striking that the actual asking of white men about their privilege does not really form the, from what I read of it. Um, yeah, maybe just it. a, just a bad headline, you know, it seemed knows? to, yeah, it seemed to come up rather late and not be very central. Um, what a couple of things struck me about it. Um, one was the sort of the, perennial elephant in the room in conversations about privilege, namely class privilege and where, if anywhere that fits in, not to say that class privilege is its own Island separate from race and gender and everything else. No, these things as the legal scholar, I believe uh, Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality and all of this as everybody up on these issues knows these things intersect. But where is class privilege in this? Well, and I, I wonder because it's about who who are the white people who come up in this? Well, students at Yale primarily and people flying first class. Now, that's not to say that none of these people would have white male privilege, but they would have something beyond what the typical white man would have, namely privilege, privilege, like in the old sense of right. lots of money and connections and all of this. And evidently Claudia yeah. Rankin has that too, since she's in all these first class cabins. Right. Well, she, she would certainly, I am not an expert on her life. Maybe it's all earned advantage, but the point is she would also be moving right in those worlds. And I guess what I think can get tricky, and this comes up even with um, Peggy McIntosh, who's um, the who came up with the notion of uh, the invisible knapsack of privilege, like where the things, the, the specific experiences that are meant to be 
sort of universal to either whiteness or maleness or whatever it is will often be very linked with wealth. And it doesn't mean that they don't have anything to do with race, but it means that they aren't going to extend to everybody um, who's white or everybody who's male or all white men. Um, and that's what I think got a little tricky there. Um, to me, it was like, what is this really about? Like, what, what, what sort of privilege is part of it? And the other aspect, though, um, was just this notion of, um, like, and then what? Like, what's meant to happen? Let's say a man in first class, white man, you know, in a nice suit for the purposes of argument, says, I acknowledge my privilege. It is massively unfair that I am the CEO of this company, of the partner in this law firm, whatever. I acknowledge it solemnly. I know I didn't deserve any of this. Then what? Let's say he says that. Is that problem solved? Is that anything? Is that just preventing somebody who hasn't had his advantages from even the joy of kind of yelling at him? You know what I mean? Like it just seems almost... Joy of yelling. Well, I don't know. Like, I just wonder, I guess I wonder, it all seems very, I guess, discursive would be the way to put it. But like, what's, it, it all seems to be anchored in getting somebody to say the right thing. And it seems completely like this, this approach, not just this article, but just this approach to thinking about privilege. It seems very much about getting people to say the right thing and completely ignores the fact that um, lots of people who know they're privileged don't want to, the norm is not to want to give it up. And this comes up specifically in the article with um, some, the man does who she talks to says he feels that his son was like deserved a place at Yale, but didn't get in or was waitlisted or something. Right. Oh yeah. He said, he said that his son did not get into Yale and it was, he said, it's apparently he said, uh, this is a quote. It's tough when you can't play the diversity card. Right. And that's rude and racist. However, I don't think that you can, he could have phrased it better, but the fact of the matter is people are going to want the best for their children, not rich white men. Everybody is going to want the best for their children. Mm -hmm. And imagining that on an individual basis, people are going to change that. Um, like, oh, there was some part of this that had struck me. Um, I just want to find it in the article because, um, okay, right. We're, uh, Rankin writes, I didn't ask this white man why he thought his son was any more entitled to a place at Yale than his son's Asian friend. And it's like, well, it's his son. Like he may, the man may also be quite racist, but I think the fact is he probably thinks his son is more entitled to a place at Yale than his son's white friend. Yeah. You know what I, or, mean? I mean, or he doesn't think he's entitled to it, but he's still disappointed on behalf yeah. of his child that he didn't get something he wanted very much. Um, right. And it just seems like there's this idealistic notion that people are going to transcend things like that. And it seems like it's, you can kind of, you can have an anti-racism that doesn't expect people to n not be that doesn't expect to sort of transcend human nature in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have actually, there's something that I keep thinking about with regard to this guy's comment, which is that since we do currently have affirmative action in place, um, it's not inaccurate to say that, you know, a, like a white kid from a privileged background lacks Things, you know, uh, if, because he's not from a marginalized background, um, which, you know, we're currently saying, like, because marginalized people have been excluded, you know, historically from, you know, these universities and these spaces um, on the basis of race. Now, the way we're going to solve that problem is that we're going to make it advantageous to be from a marginalized background. You know, it will count in your favor. Um you know, and I think that that was established pretty well by that lawsuit that is still ongoing, right? It's like against Harvard um, that, you know, to the tune of some number of SAT points, um, it can be advantageous to you to come from a background that's historically been underrepresented at colleges. Well, I think it's very, the whole college admissions thing is super tricky because I think the, 
once again, the elephant in the room class. The thing that makes it really easy to get, or much easier to get into somewhere like Harvard is being super duper rich. Right. And that's the main thing. I think the people who kind of fall through the cracks a little bit are the like somewhat privileged, but not very privileged. And um, so this is something I looked into a bit for my book and that like basically anybody who comes across as privileged, but is just kind of middle class, but doesn't know not to like talk about their possessions in a materialistic sounding way is like, oh, let's get rid of these privileged people. But anybody whose family is going to donate the gym, well, that's good. Cause they, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I think what ends up happening is you get people from that sort of like upper middle class type background who will be like very, very angry at people from marginalized backgrounds who they think have, you know, taken spots that they wanted, but they don't sort of realize to be angry at the very, very rich people who sort of are more taking spots at these schools. Um, So, yeah, I guess, but I think in, in general, yeah, I mean, it's, so what I'm wondering is, yeah. yes, it's, you know, it's rude. Like you're not supposed to say that out loud. We all know you're not supposed to say that out loud. At the same time, I, I wonder if it's truly, is it really racist to, you know, to acknowledge that the current system makes, a, you know, like a semi-privileged, mediocre white kid, um, you know, even, or even if he has good grades or whatever, like that there are limitations to how appealing he well, can make himself to. Come. I don't know if it's racist in the sense of if you talk about one very specific fact, but I think what can be problematic to use that annoying word is to only look at that and not look at legacy admissions, sports admissions, super rich people admissions, mm-hmm. and the whole scheme of it in which members of underrepresented groups who, you know, may well be very impressive and just went to not as, you know, prestigious a school or whatever, getting in is like a blip in, you know what I mean? So I think if you're not, if the only part of the system you're aware of is affirmative action for, you know, then I think if you, if you're not sort of seeing the whole picture, that's kind of missing something. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it's also, like, I just don't think it's accurate that that it's easier now to get into these schools if you're marginalized. I think what's accurate is, like, the bigger picture way of understanding it that makes sense to me is that it's easier to get in if you're at the top than possibly at the bottom. And then if you're sort of in the middle or upper middle, you have to have really excelled in some way Mm -hmm. something like that but I also think it's hard to I've also thought about the these issues a lot and like read a lot about it and if you haven't I don't know how much ill will is there I don't know I don't know yeah I mean it's one of those things where I think it's difficult to just you know this this is the case in a few different spots in this essay where there is an offhand comment that goes you know uninterrogated um but like analyzed practically to death where you, you just don't really know what exactly was meant by it. Well, it also doesn't make sense. The, the Asian aspect specifically doesn't make sense because as I understand these recent news stories, it ought to have been harder for the Asian friend to get in than yes. the white guy. So that seemed like it's on its own whole question that sort of, yeah. 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 Who knows, you know, who knows where that conversation might have gone had it actually been a conversation and also how well, you know, this guy who's just kind of like spitballing at an airport actually understands college admissions. Maybe had a few of these um, tiny bottles that people. On yeah, airplane. it's true. He could have, he could have been, you know, three deep <laughs> in first in first class. They just give them away. Oh boy. I, I don't know. Um, I guess yeah. I wanna, so the thing that, that stuck out about this essay to me um, was how, I mean, it's, it's one of many, I think, at this point, examples of this phenomenon, but how ineffective it is to try to take privilege framework out of a classroom or out of like this academic space and start trying to apply it to your real world interactions with other human beings. Because yes. all that happens is 
that it, it obscures everyone's humanity because identity is so big and so important. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it just doesn't leave room for you to recognize, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, Claudia Rankin in, in, in this essay, I think, doesn't see the humanity of a lot of the men that she's, you know, trying to engage with um, because she just sees them first and foremost as representatives of their race and their sex. And, um, you know, if at all, it's a distant second that she sees them as individuals. But the other thing that's bad is that she assumes they're looking at her through that same lens, um, which I think is just not as common, honestly, as people in these academic circles or, you know, progressive circles where privilege framework is, is used a lot to have these discussions. I don't think it's as common as they might imagine. Well, I think, so there are a couple of things there. Um, and I will try to restrict it to a couple of things because this is a ah, book topic. And I, even though my book is like from a million years ago, well, whatever, two years ago now, I, um, I'm still obsessed with the topic apparently. Um, one is the whole feelings projection thing. And that is just, any article that's based on this person surely feels X about me is always a little like her gut instinct about this might be right, but who knows? And it's all sort of tricky, Mm -hmm. but also um, this question of individual, I don't know if it's about academia versus the real world so much as just like, these are just things that are just true, all things equal in the world, but they're not true about, individuals necessarily so all things equal you can say which groups have it easier or harder on an individual basis you just don't know Mm -hmm. and i think that's um where the privilege approach kind of um falls apart and i'm thinking about a tweet that went viral recently that i have to bring up in this context um by the writer uh nicole cliff about saying that um having decent parents is a huge form of privilege, something like that. And it's like, that's true in a sense. I I mean, I would rather say that it's, it should be the norm and it's bad if you don't rather than saying it's privilege, but that's another whole semantic thing that I could, I'm not going to get into. But the point is like the privilege framework is about obscuring things like that because that's not an identity category. It's not visible apart from uh, these prompts on Twitter where people share everything, most people are not very public about things like this. And you're never going to know that about them. And you don't know which of the douchey seeming white men in first class at an airport had nice parents and which ones had abusive parents, because you can't assume you don't know. And I feel like the privilege framework is very much about picking this kind of set number of identity categories, maybe adding to them here and there, but saying like, if you're a cis straight white man, you don't know what it's like to this, this, or this. And there, then there can be a homeless man who's cis straight and white. Does he really have it so easy? You know, things of that nature. So I think the problem with the privilege framework in part is really this, um, making it impossible to understand that somebody might have it really bad, but in a way that can't be easily categorized. Mm-hmm. Um, not that she should be pitying these men she sees in the airport because they could be having a bad day. I mean, it's just you just don't know what's going on with people, basically. Yeah, I would say, you know, not pity, pity, not necessary, but just, you know, it, it takes a lot of energy to look around at people and just kind of assume the most uncharitable thing about them, about what's I going guess. on in their head. Yeah, I mean, I guess well, the other thing, though, that did come to mind is I think sometimes people are super racist in public spaces. And I think the problem with focusing on the sort of very micro of microaggressions and the sort of feelings projection aspect is I'm sure, like, I really would assume that she has had more sort of unambiguous experiences simply from just when I would commute on New Jersey transit um, a few years ago. Every time, so this is not going to apply. This is intersectionally a little bit different. Every time there was a seat with a black man, however dressed, however old, sitting in it, the seat next to that man would be empty. Nobody would want to sit next to a black man on that commute. That's bizarre. Now, I am a big fan of sitting down, and (laughs) I don't understand this. Uh, But this would be this thing that I would notice. And I, I'm sure, notice only a tiny fraction of 
such things being that I am not a black man, obviously, but I don't find it hard to believe that people are racist in the States and in other countries in public spaces. And I think if you're dealing with that sort of thing all the time, it's not so strange that you would um, start to do shortcuts and assume that that's what's happening and have a less than charitable notion. I think the problem with this article is that only focused on the very ambiguous, like where even her therapist, right. Says, says, yeah, you're, you know, you're, you're, o- you're over, thing. you're overestimating, you know, right. how, how large you loom in other people's right. imaginations, which, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm curious, like, I wish that, you know, it would have been a solid foundation for this piece for her to talk a little bit more about some of the more egregious stuff she's experienced, which I'm sure she has, um, you know, throughout her life traveling while black, you know, right. Yeah. Um, or just in general, you know, to, to kind of frame the reasons for her approaching these situations the way she does. But as it is, um, as in when her, when her therapist brings this up to her, um, and I thought this was really interesting. She kind of takes offense to it. She's like, well, is that supposed to make me feel better? Like that I was, you know, that I was invisible to these men as opposed to, you know, being actively insulted. But I mean, that's the case for most of us. You know, we just are not. Yeah. And in most of that life, much we're all to invisible to one another. And I yeah. think, yeah, I, I think it's tricky because I think there needs to be space to write about the subtle and things like that. I think the problem is it's not going to persuade anyone who doesn't already agree with you and is arguably just not pointing to something accurate because if you don't actually know what's going on with somebody else and you can't really point to anything. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I guess the main thing I, I found with this is really just this question of, let's say these men were articulate about their white male privilege then what? And then that in turn brings up, there was this other article that I thought was interesting and we'll have to return to more closely later um, by Jillian Steinhauer, also in the Times, um, a review of an exhibit in New York, an art exhibit called by Risa Puno called The Privilege of Escape. It's an escape room, but like an art exhibit about privilege and um, different sort of how sort of showing through the experience um, how some have it easier than others. And from um, Jillian Steinhauer's review of this, I thought this was super interesting. She wrote, um, when I found out that, and she overall liked the exhibit, but she wrote, uh, when I found out that my team had been given an advantage, I felt guilty as if we had cheated, not an unreasonable reaction, but not a constructive one either. And the facilitated discussion that followed didn't push me to consider the experience more deeply or critically. This is, I think, a missed opportunity. After all, the most pressing question regarding privilege isn't how does it make you feel, but what can you do about it? And I guess to me that seems like that's not the problem with this escape room. That's the problem with the whole privilege conversation is that it's like people need to acknowledge it. And like, so what? Let's say they acknowledge it. Yes. They don't necessarily not want it. And I think in the real world of actual people, especially people who are not very, very guilty feeling 19 year olds with trust funds, as in most of humanity, right? You're aware of the things where you've been cheated. You're not as aware of the things you've been given. And you're not in a position to be like, I want less. Take everything I have. I want less. I don't have, I, I don't deserve what I have. I want less. Like, yeah. Who feels like that? Um, and it just seems like a very uh, unproductive way of, progress i think better to think of like a more equal society benefiting everybody than like imagining that somebody who's struggling but has gotten like their you know the job they got at a gas station they got through connections how unfair they should get rid of that job they should stop having that job you know what i mean like that's effectively what this is saying and it's like ah yeah i mean i I was fascinated by the idea of the art exhibit itself. Um, I think, you know, are we just like kind of segueing into talking about the privilege escape room? Do we have anything else to say about that? Okay. So goodbye. I mean, yes, but well, yeah. (laughs) Um, So I thought it was fascinating because the 
a, like when you go in and you and you're on your team, um, the assignation of the different levels of privilege is completely random. Like it's not based on anything. So basically right, right, what, right. what she's created, this artist whose name I've already forgotten. Um, is, um, Risa Puno. Right. I believe. Risa Puno. Um, yeah. She has created um, just like a, a scenario where either you're, you're lucky or you're unlucky. Um, and it's interesting to think about how interchangeable the word privilege is with the word luck and what, what happens when you start using the latter instead of the former. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, especially because we always talk about privilege, like it's such a hard thing to understand. It has to be hammered home and it's, you know, it's got to be discussed ad infinitum in, in all of these different, often very elite spheres. Um, but the concept of being lucky in life or unlucky in life, lucky in circumstance or not, um, is something that everybody kind of innately understands. Right. I mean, I think privilege, um, the way I see it is it's luck, but it's also with this added aspect of at the scale of being really, really posh versus re really, really poor. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's like wealth. It's, it's an analogy to wealth. So it's not just like I was lucky the bus came early. You know what I mean? Like it's, oh, gotta but, be you know, I was lucky to be born to, you know, to, into a stable household, you know, in a nice neighborhood. Um, or, right. Right. I mean, I think, yeah. And like when you were saying that, you know, it's, it's easier, you know, people, people understand where they've been cheated. Um, you know, I think that that's, that still applies there. You know, you can recognize the ways in which you've been unlucky. Um, maybe it's I think easier. it's more salient for people day to day, the ways they've been unlucky than the ways they've been lucky. And I also just don't see human nature changing. Mm -hmm. in that regard. I think, and I think, you know, there are people have legitimate things to complain about. And I think a privilege framework is actually quite um, reactionary in that it basically asks you not to complain on if you're aware that anybody has it worse. Mm -hmm. And then like, why have unions? Why have any, you know, like get rid of it all. Right. Because there's always somebody who has it worse and why ever want better, you know, so, right. I'm not so sure about that, but, um, ah, we have so many, um, topics and so many bad men. I don't know if we're going to get through all of the... Oh, gosh. Well, let's talk men. about... Which bad man do you want to... Should we talk about the crane wife? I think so. I think we might try to do the, the crane wife and... Yeah. The, the, other, the other thing we can talk about next time. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. We'll see with the other bad men. Yeah. Well, let, let's start I feel with the like, I feel like we need to make sure that like in discussing this, when we say bad men, we're being kind of tongue in cheek because sometimes, That's right. people, sometimes people in the comments get upset about this. They do. <laughs> they do. They think that if we're talking about a phenomenon, we're endorsing it, even if we're talking about it critically, but you know, yeah. comments, what are you going to do? Yeah. When we say bad men, we're, we're just, you know, we're just being zeitgeisty. We don't actually right. think that all of these men. Well, we want bad. them, we want them banished to <laughs> Devil's Island, like Dreyfus, to do a little crossover with the other podcast. Um, that you, you've That's managed now to work the Dreyfus affair into this kind of like, I had okay. to. I had to. Um, we got a bingo yeah, so, card going. So I don't okay. know if we're going to get to all the bad, bad men, whatever. So bad, sad. an essay that we both found interesting in the Paris Review by the writer C.J. Hauser called The Crane Wife. And I don't know how, if you were also first alerted to it in this way, but I was first alerted to it by the, was it, is the word rapturous? By the incredibly enthusiastic and sort of, I identify with this style tweets. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was getting... Yeah, a uh, a younger friend of mine who's in her mid twenties um, was really really into it, and that was uh, you know she she felt that it resonated in all kinds of ways with her own life experiences, um, and so yeah, it was uh, that was how I became aware of it. Um, for me, it was like a lot of my timeline seemed very interested in it, and then somehow I found this is not somebody I follow, but somebody retweeted it or something. Um, Karen Chi tweeted. Cat person grew up to be crane wife. Okay, is this tweet for anybody out there? And um, <laughs> is it not for us? I mean, 
<laughs> basically it's like, so this is an essay by a fiction writer. So it reads very much as fiction, but I believe is a personal essay. I think mm -hmm. seems to be like 90% sure that it's an essay and not fiction. Um, from just that it's a blog post, I don't think would be fiction. But anyway, um, it definitely, it's very zeitgeisty. It's very much like a story that taps into universal things to some extent, but also um, it's very much like the feminism of, of this minute in certain ways. Yes. I, I want to say yes and no, um, because I think that, you know, it's, it's true that there's a hunger right now for these stories that kind of capture like the little indignities and like the things that are infuriating or upsetting or, or diminishing about being a heterosexual woman, um, you know, in love or in a relationship right now. But I think that actually um, the thing that I was thinking about a lot is um, the short stories of Dorothy Parker that actually captured this same kind of phenomenon. Um, there's something she wrote called a telephone call that is like all about that um, from back, you know, when we all talked on the phone instead of texting um, about sitting and waiting for a man to call you and getting more and more hysterical as the minutes pass and he does not call. And you start wondering, like, was I supposed to call him? No, I can't call him because I'll look desperate. Mm -hmm. um, and this was written in like the twenties. So I think that, you know, there's um, in some ways, this is an evergreen kind of form mm. of art that's interesting um i mean i think i think what made it feel now like feel very of the moment to me was well two things one is this sort of it's about that feeling of neediness but it's a it's a self-critique both about being hard on oneself for being needy but also about being needy and that's what made it so interesting and also you know, like normally if you say about a personal essay or fiction that it seems very much of the zeitgeist that seems like an insult to the quality of it. And I didn't find that at all. I thought it was really well done and super interesting and um, left me with a lot to think about. But so it includes these. Um, so this part, I'm just going to read a quote from it. Um, I need you to know, I hated that I needed more than this from him. There is nothing more humiliating to me than my own desires. Nothing makes me hate myself more than being burdensome and less than self-sufficient. I did not want to feel like the kind of nagging woman who might exist in a sitcom. These were small things, and I told myself it was stupid to feel disappointed by them. I had arrived in my 30s believing that to need things from others made you weak. I think this is true for lots of people, but I think it is especially true for women. When men desire things, they're passionate. When they feel they have not received something they need they're deprived or even emasculated and given permission for all sorts of behavior but when a woman needs she is needy so it's this kind of feminist case for caring and i think i'm thinking of i think it was alana massey who wrote something like against chill it was like from a few years ago but it seems similar to that like the sort of feminist case against being the cool girl like mm -hmm. the gone girl which i think is back there um especially this line um where her ex-fiance he said he wanted to be with me because i wasn't annoying or needy because i liked beer because i was low maintenance so it's this kind of like feminist rejection of that but and this is where i think it gets super complicated it's also like there are these weird it's not exactly privileged disclaimers but it's kind of like these Asides apologizing for caring about this at all to begin with. So um, there are worse things than not receiving love. There are sadder stories than this. There are species going extinct and a planet warming. I told myself, who are you to complain? You with these frivolous extracurricular needs. Um, and she writes also later about like sort of famine and stuff. And she's, so it's kind of this weirdly tentative defense of even writing about love to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that to me seemed very now that it has to be framed as this kind of 
like professional triumph story. Like she transcends the breakup by having this very interesting adventure where she's doing um, scientific background research for a novel. So it's not that just that she throws herself into work, but it's interesting work. Right. And she calls off, her, she calls off her wedding reader. Right. She did not marry him. Right. 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 <laughs> right. She writes that. Yeah, she does. Um, and that like that, there was something sort of privileged disclaimery about the sort of like, why am I even talking about love to begin with? But also this sort of like, as if the most feminist stance to land on is like, like the, the essay hovers between that the most feminist stance to land on is to not care about love at all, or to sort of feel entitled to care about love. And mm-hmm. it doesn't really have an answer. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I mean, I really thought this was a phenomenal piece of writing and I'm really looking For forward sure. to, to reading her book, um, which is called family of origin. I think I am, I am ordering it today and I'm very excited. Um, oh, because, I want to read it as well. She, yeah, she's, a, yeah, she can really, she can really, really write. I mean, it's um, just like, it's so well done. And I, I got why everyone was sharing. I think the problem sometimes when things like this happen and then when they kind of blow up is you imagine that it's going to be like a think piece mm-hmm. and that it's like, there's a lot more to it, but on Twitter, it's very hard to tell. Like I could kind of guess from just like who was sharing it that it would probably be interesting, but you never know. Yeah. I mean, I actually, um, maybe it was just because I read it the day that I had taken a red eye home from San Diego and was, you know, so exhausted and like just not interested in being kind of in the discourse at all. But when I read this, I just read it as a personal essay and not really as like, without having to worry about kind of what everybody I knew in, you know, my professional and social circles might be saying about it and whether it, you know, how it fit into the zeitgeist. It's just like a really well done piece of writing. And it was a relief actually to engage with with an essay in that way Um, without all this extra baggage. Oh, I didn't have the option because I'm trying to write some stuff about something tangentially related to this. And then it's Um, like, it fell into the work pile, but it is really good. It is really good. Yeah. Um, oh. I actually, I'm just going to admit that I, I stayed up um, that night Googling more than I probably should have trying to figure out who the fiance was because he sounds like a monster. Um, but then I started, yeah. then it occurred to me, and this was, this was the one like piece of analysis that I did do that, um, you know, when somebody describes their ex like a villain, that's often a sign that things were a little more complicated than you're necessarily going to hear about from them. Um, right. And yet I didn't care that much. It's still a really good essay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's definitely good. Um I think as much as our remaining uh I don't think we have time for them, two more topics are amazing. And we yeah. may just have to So we're, let's, do, let's do them as recommends, maybe, at least for Yes, the, let's yeah. do that. Let's do that. So that leaves us with um well two on topic recommends then and one Tangent, very tangential recommend. So um, one is the Harvard professor who got scammed in the cut by uh, Kira Balonik, um, or Balonik, uh, Bruce Hay, a law professor at Harvard who um, was scammed in a very elaborate way. Um, and it's sort of unclear why, like the woman who scammed him it was kind of like a honey trap but like with no real purpose other than the patriarchy yeah like just she, wanted to just wanted to kind of entrap him. him and humiliate him yeah actually um so this is I mean, mostly we're just saying like to recommend this because oh, but, it's, oh we're gonna it'll be like three hours what, later and what yeah. a story um but i it did strike me that there was an example of undiscussed or less discussed privilege going on in this essay in that Maria Pia, one of the um, main antagonists uh, in the piece, would never have been able to um, do her do her evil deeds if she weren't a very beautiful woman. Um, Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Pretty well, privilege. Beauty, mm, could be. <laughs> I mean, the the beauty angle interested me as well in terms of this discussion that kind of broke out on Twitter that I you know here and there tried to get into. Um, but that, like, should, was he a fool is kind of the basic question the the piece poses. But just specifically, like, 
was he a fool for not being suspicious that a much younger, beautiful woman came up to him in a hardware store and told him that she finds him very attractive? And I may have weighed in on this saying that I think women do to whether it's male privilege or something unfortunate for men, I don't know how you want to put it. I don't think men are like rated according to their beauty as often by randos their whole lives. And I don't think they have as much of a sense of how attractive they are or are not. Plus I think there's this kind of misguided notion in the culture that because some very famous and charismatic and rich old men do very well with like supermodels that all older men are inherently interesting to attractive younger women. So I feel like in a way one could frame that as a male privilege or entitlement or whatever, but it also could kind of screw over a man who like make, it could kind of lead to a certain naivete about this. Whereas I think a woman an equivalent, like, if a 50 something woman who's a professor at Harvard is hit on in that way by a man in the hardware store, who's very attractive, she might be more suspicious. Well, you would think so. And yet, um, I don't know if you've listened to or read uh, the LA times series about dirty John, which also became a show um, Mm. on Bravo starring Eric Bana as dirty John and Connie Britton as his Mark. Um, Okay. I think so, you know, without spoiling anything and, you know, we don't want to, you know, talk around this story too much because, you know, spoilers or whatever. But um, I will say I'm going to come down on the side that it's human nature to be, you know, trusting in situations where it seems like your trust is warranted or even where you have no good reason not to trust. Um, and that we, you know, it's, I mean, we're social animals. It's, it's, you know, it's in our best yeah. interest, too. but just to say that there are people out there who are very good at exploiting, you know, that human tendency, um, you know, people who are scam artists and mm-hmm. that I am disinclined to be cruel to anybody who is taken in by that because it happens to all right. the people. I mean, I think there's a way of wondering if there's a, gender specificity here that isn't what an idiot that guy is. You know what I mean? Like, I think, I guess where I fall on this is both feeling bad for him and thinking there's something very sort of gendered about that type of trap. And Maybe. I mean, I, mean, I don't, I don't think it, it doesn't make me hate him or something. It just makes me think, I, I guess the way I, I think of it is not so different from like the plot in like a teen movie where, the popular kids are suddenly nice to the geeky kid and the geeky kid has to kind of wonder what's up. You know what I mean? I feel like, but, but I feel like women in that situation would know whether they're the popular kid or the geeky kid and men just wouldn't. Maybe. And yet there are so many stories of women being taken in, in similar. There are, there are, there are. I mean, I have also read not that particular one, but I have read, um, or maybe it was that particular one. Hmm. I have read about this. So it, it does happen also to women. So who knows? So who knows? Yeah. Maybe it's not as gendered as all that, but it's a, quite a story and definitely worth a read. Um, also another recommend from the same publication, also from the cut by Jessica Pressler, totally off topic about the, a story about the Grace Church preschool where children's artwork at an auction was one piece sold for upwards of $10,000. I'm quoting. Um, And then it's about all the drama at a very posh preschool between the old money and new money parents and the old director and the new director. Oh my goodness. It's like gossip girl, but then you keep remembering that the children are like three (laughs) and it's just really funny. And it has nothing to do with the children. I mean, that's also, what's nice. It's like, it's nothing to like, no children were harmed. The parents. <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and it, yeah, in terms of people wanting the best for their children in ways that might be a little, yeah, it's just, it's hilarious. It's just beautifully written. Not, I don't know, just like beautifully, like hilarious. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's really very entertaining. It also um, made me relieved that I don't have children and will never have to, you know, even wow. like brush up against. It made me relieved to be raising a child in Canada, which is this egalitarian utopia where I'm just kidding. There's all sorts of stuff in Toronto, but not to the 
same degree as in New York, I think. I don't know yet. I have a baby. At least um, you guys get free healthcare. <laughs> yeah, we do. And it's, it's fantastic, actually. Um, speaking of health, our final recommend, Thomas Stackpole's article from earlier this month in the New York Times opinion in the Sunday Review, and I feel it's relevant that it was not put in the style section, Ooh. assuming it wasn't, at least online it wasn't, seems to have been opinion rather than style, about male dieting and male eating disorders slash disordered eating, not that these are the same thing, although there can be blurriness. And it's interesting. I didn't love it because I thought it kind of, like it was, it's interesting to bring up this whole issue of these tech bros who fast for like optimum performance as versus like, how is that different from, not eating to fit into the old jeans that used to fit or whatever. But I guess I didn't love it because I felt like it kind of wasn't very clearly written about whether is it truly only like is dieting only about something more or an eating disorder only about something more when it's a man. Yeah. We disagreed, you know, I think possibly on this one. Well, I mean, I'm, I am coming at this from a couple of different, perspectives. One is that, um, you know, in like the fitness world, um, you have male bodybuilders who are extremely straightforward about, you know, how they eat and how they diet to achieve a certain look. Um, and you know, it's just, it's just kind of part of the deal. You know, there's nothing unusual about it. What's funny is that, you know, you get out of that world and into like the world of ordinary men who are supposed to maybe not care about that kind of stuff. And in order to make it acceptable, maybe to themselves and to other men, it has to be reframed, not as, you know, I'm dieting to achieve a certain aesthetic, but I'm unlocking, I'm hacking my body. I'm unlocking my total potential. Right. Um, but the other thing, and um, this was, I think, something that, you know, we both kind of quibbled with, um, but maybe from different angles, is that um, he mentions that eating disorders have been framed as a, as a women's issue for a long time. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, they've been framed really not just as a women's issue, but as a feminist issue with the fault supposedly being, um, you know, that the patriarchy imposes these punishing beauty standards on us. Um, so does it potentially complicate the narrative that eating disorders may not really be as gendered as we previously imagined? Ah, that could, hmm. Well, it's like with the incel article and the about the incels who get all this plastic surgery. Um, I think the notion that men don't care what they look like is simplistic. It, it gets at something true. I think looks matter more for women than men in situations that don't even have to do with dating. You know, like I think for everybody they matter in dating, but I think for women just like getting a job being attractive will matter more maybe than for a man. Things like that would be just my hypothesis there. Hmm. But, um, and just sort of how you're treated in society, maybe it matters more, but I think men care a lot more than women might realize. I think that's probably accurate. Um, but I guess what I, I don't know. I feel like I've read things on this topic over the years, including this that are sort of like, you would think that the only people who have eating disorders are these vain, teenage, rich, white, whatever girls. But in fact, it's a serious issue that impacts other demographics. And it's like, isn't it serious, even if it's impacting the overrepresented? Yeah, I don't know. Do they not yeah. suffer? It's true. But I mean, those, not all, but the ones with the eating disorders. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why not? Um, mental, mental health and all of that. So... Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I'm i going to come out against not eating for a day a week, um, but I'm not a health professional. I have a PhD in French, and we believe in having lots of wine and cheese and pastries. Yes. So, well, yeah. I, you know, I'm going to let you have the, the last word on that. As a, as a semi-fitness professional, I endorse the, uh, the French way. <laughs> Well, très bien, as they say in the French. Um, 
And, and this concludes. Yeah. 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 I think that's, we have so much more, but we have to stop at some point. So yes. yeah. I had to turn off my air conditioner to have this conversation and it's getting really hot in here. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> so. we don't have air conditioning in this room. Um, and I've been getting stickier throughout. Yep. All right. So um, glow, a glow. It's a, a glow. glow. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, viewers. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, it's intentional. All right. Uh, Till next time. This We've been feminine, feminine chaos. chaos. <laughs> Bye. Bye.